Right. We're now recording. So it's my great pleasure to introduce John Torday as the final speaker of this meeting. And John is going to talk about, his, it, it's called Unus Mundus, and he will tell us more about that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I, yes, we am can I hear you. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Okay. Okay, despite the Atlantic Ocean. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so I actually modified the title and I'm actually going to ultimately address Gödel's incompleteness theorem or a sol my solution to it. So I'm sort of setting things up here. Um, let's see, how do I get to the next slide? Uh, okay. So my speculation is that the following is uh, the solution for the Gödel incompleteness theorem, but you be, uh, be the judge of that. Thank you. Okay. Understanding consciousness is the most important thing we need. Uh, so I'm getting blocked out here. Sorry. Oops. We need to, uh, yeah, there's there's a bubble. Pardon. You want a slide before this one? No, you said you were skipping some stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. No, it's there. It's just being blocked by this bubble for some oh. reason. Um, let's see. I can't get rid of it. Okay, so I'll, I'll tolerate it somehow. Uh, yeah. Okay, so consciousness is the most important thing we need to understand. And in conventional terms, it's referred to as the explanatory gap, the, that, that is the gap between brain and mind. But I will demonstrate that consciousness is distributed through physiology. The evolution of physiology has been traced back to the unicell using cell, cell communication, a publication of ours, back in 2012. And the mechanism of evolution, as I claimed in that article, was symbiogenesis. Uh, it's the assimilation of factors in the environment. Uh, that's Lynn Margulis' uh, hypothesis and now theory, published first in 1967. By the way, Margulis was uh, Carl Sagan's wife at that time. This is a constructive process in deference to a destruction, a destructive process. So the question is, why construction? Uh, as a consequence, physiology operates in the same, on, uh, based on the same laws of nature as the cosmos. Co consciousness is our awareness of the cosmological laws of nature, and this is why we feel that there is something greater than ourselves. So here's a schematic. I'm, I'm saying that in the beginning uh, of Earth's history, there were lipids uh, floating in water on the surface of the Earth. Uh, the poets always beat us to the punch. So, for example, Robert Frost said that life is that which can mix oil and water, which to a physical chemist would be nonsense, but to a poet, it works. Uh, and I'll try and convince you that that's true. So there were these snowball asteroids that struck the surface of the atmosphereless Earth, um, and they came from pulsars. Um, uh, as uh, these snowballs that contain both water and lipids, polycyclic hydrocarbons, and that uh, and the fusion of, uh, or the formation of uh, micelles from lipids was the demarcation between Bohm's implicate and explicate orders, which I'm showing on the right in his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. So schematically, uh, what I'm showing is the, the surface of the water. You have these lipids, which are referred to in, in uh, lipid chemistry as amphiphiles. They have positive and negative charges on them at either pole. Um, and for that reason, they orient with the, the lipid soluble end of the, molecule, of the lipid molecule downward into the water and the positive char positively charged um, end pointing upwards. And that's facilitated by Earth's gravity. So this is a, there's a phase transition that occurs once you pack enough of these lipids together because the negative charges neutralize the van der Waals force uh, of uh, surface tension of the water and so what you get is a phase transition uh, to form this micelle. It's this uh, structure that I'm showing here uh, as a dotted as dotted a dotted line surrounding a, a, a circle, if you will. Um, and um, so basically, the lipids go from molecules to this structure. And so there's a quantum leap, literally, that occurs here. And that's the connection between our existence and that of the cosmos through the through quantum mechanics. Um, and th the cell, as it evolves, follows three uh, first principles of physiology, as I've published it. Um, there's negative entropy, 
chemiosmosis as the mechanism at the time that I could address as the energy to provide the, the horsepower for the negative entropic state. And then that's all controlled by homeostasis. And homeostasis is critical for what I'm about to talk about. It's basically the fundamental of, of everything. Okay, so here's a more complicated uh, diagram, and I've numbered it. So we have gravitational force causing this formation of the micelle. Um, I've attributed the relationship between the symbiogenic process uh, that Margulis came up with, with quantum entanglement in a recent publication this year. Um, and the reason that I, I postulated the quantum mechanics or quantum entanglement was the origin of symbiogenesis is because like symbiogenesis, it, quantum entanglement also maintains homeostasis. So that's step two and three. And now I'm going back here. I'm citing these first principles of physiology as the reference point, ultimately for the cell. <clears throat> and furthermore, as I showed in a paper published back in 2003, if you put dif differentiated cells into zero gravity uh, using a device that NASA sponsored years ago, um, the cell will lose its phenotypic identity. It will lose its evolutionary history. And if you put the cell back into unit gravity, it will reestablish that, that phenotypic history. So it's a rever reversible process. So evolution is being driven literally by the gravitational force that initiated life in the first place. So that's step four over here on the far right. So another way to look at this, um, we know that as the lung evolved, uh, if you look at the schematic on the left, I start with the swim bladder of a fish, which basically uses gases, oxygen in, uh, particularly, to, um, to regulate buoyancy um, in water. And um, that structure is now known through cell molecular biology uh, in contradistinction to the conventional way of thinking about the evolution of lung, which was from the gill, that was an analogy, not a homology in the sense that it was an, of the same origin. So if you look at that diagram, you're going from the swim bladder of the fish at the lower left to that of the amphibian as you uh, go from water to land, temporarily at any rate, to reptilians and mammalians. And, and that process is underpinned by the uh, utilization of these pink cells. These are smooth muscle cells, which then are uh, co-opted to form the, the wall of the alveolus as it gets smaller and smaller. And in order to achieve that, in order to go from a larger to a smaller surface area of, of the alveolus, you have to produce what's called lung surfactant, which reduces the surface tension uh, but caused based upon the law of Laplace that would otherwise not allow this process to occur. So on the right, uh, I show with a Cartesian coordinate alveolarization versus time. And I'm saying that uh, Einstein's energy mass re uh, relationship actually is the basis for this process of lung evolution in particular. So I'm uh, showing that stepwise, what happens is that um, energy is being uh, facilitated by the evolution um, of the lung providing oxygen for metabolic evolution. So in reality, when you look, when I as an embryologist look at this process, what's actually happening is it's not uh, per se uh, the transition from a fertilized egg to two cells, four cells, eight cells. That's description. What it actually constitutes is a series of high energy phosphate exchanges. So it's all about energy, not matter. And the way in which this is all occurring, as I indicated in the lower left, is by cell-cell interactions. Okay, and the origin for the Cartesian coordinates on the right um, is the Big Bang. So man, or I'm talking about man as the cell, or the origin of man, is the measure of all things. That was Protagoras back um, in ancient Greece. There was no explicate or implicate order, boom, before life began. The cell as a topology, partitioning the explicate and implicate orders, defining the interface between the outside and inside of the cell. Therefore, math and physics are superseded by biology, unlike the Rutherford's put down of biology as uh, all sciences, either physics or stamp collecting. Um, I'm going to try and disabuse you of that idea. Husserl's The Origin of Geometry um, article published in 1936 says the same thing about mathematics being external to biology. 
Similarly, Wheeler's meaning circuit, John Wheeler's meaning circuit hypothesis and Mario Livio's golden ratio uh, book published in 2016, similarly speculate that mathematics is innate to us. So another way to look at this is if you look on the far left, uh, I'm again, I'm saying that you have this uh, effect of gravity um, on uh, quantum entanglement, which in turn gave rise to symbiogenesis, which I'm uh, showing here. If you look at the top row, uh, these X's and Y's, this is a schematic for symbiogenesis. And that in fact is the way in which we have evolved the X, uh, Bohm's X, explicate order of physiology. Um, okay. And, and I'm trying to intimate here that that actually originated originated from cosmic gravity as a non-local consciousness uh, mechanism. So looking at the Big Bang some 13.7 billion years ago, we have at the left a de schematic depiction of that event, um, which was a singularity or the unus, uh, or Jung, Carl Jung's unus mundus. Uh, that generated a vector with a an origin and then a, um, a, a the, the vector then has proceeded on with over time over the course of time, and we in turn have evolved to adapt to those to that uh, cosmic uh, or the uh, expand the uh, expansion of the cosmos. So another way to think about that is as a lattice work. So for example, stellar uh, nu uh, nucleosynthesis or stellar evolution, stars generate light. And in, uh, as a byproduct of light, they produce uh, at least the first 36 atom, atom, um, atoms or elements, uh, I'm sorry, from hydrogen to iron in, a, in the exact same sequence as their atomic number. So that provides a lattice work, which through endosymbiosis or symbiogenesis, we have internalized. And so, for example, there's a gap between iron, uh, atomic number 36, and atomic number 53, iodine. However, because biology has memory, so lipids actually have, um, they exhibit <laughs> hysteresis, and that hysteresis is the molecular memory of biology. That memory allows allowed biology to remember this process by which it, it, it internalized and of symbi um, symbiogenically these atomic uh, or these elements. And so the thyroid evolved uh, of mammals evolved from the endostyle of lampreys, so invertebrate um, organisms to form the thyroid and uh, allow for the utilization of iodine to form, to generate thyroxin. So, so the, thyro the uh, lattice work of the cosmos through stellar, uh, stellar nuclear nucleosynthesis is what provides this information to biology. There is a school of thought similarly that gravity is the origin of uh, how the particulates after the Big Bang formed planets. So now you have a common mechanism for both planetary evolution and, and the biology that uh, exists on the surface of the planet as well. So there's a common mechanism for both. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm uh, schematizing into some symbiosis at the top, going from X to XY to XYZ, et cetera. And I'm saying that uh, the, the, the first step in the evolution of consciousness, if you look at the bottom uh, description, was uh, the first step was binary. That is, the cell membrane is a semi-permeable membrane governing uh, what substances would enter or and exit the cell. And then those factors that are internalized, the X, Y, X, X, Y, and X, X, Y, Z schematic is analog. And that actually is what provides the basis for physiology through this cell-cell communication mechanism. But there's a connection between local consciousness on the left and cosmic consciousness through the mechanism that I'm alluding to. Evolution is non-commutative because it complies with terminal addition, adding newly evolved traits onto the end of an evolved trait, not the middle or beginning, which would result in extinction. Uh, largely because it would just take too much time, and in, in the time course of not doing uh, practicing terminal uh, addition, the animal would become extinct. Because evolution is a function of cell-cell communication, it is inefficient to add a newly evolved trait in the middle or the beginning of an evolved trait. Therefore, newly acquired traits are only added at the end of evolved traits, or what is commonly described in biology as terminal addition. 
The form of evolution being described in this inverse of random mutation based upon Darwinian evolution is striking to me anyway. Uh, and I firmly believe that random mutation is, is a one-off. It's not the basic process by which evolution has occurred. Conversely, evolution is determined by its context uh, within the environment, striving to reestablish homeostasis. So in other words, uh, cosmic uh, or uh, the uh, expansion of the cosmos gives rise to the uh, uh, ever-changing environment and the uh, uh, organism um, life has evolved to maintain homeostasis over the course of those, that pro ongoing process. Operationally, if evolution were random, it would not have been possible to trace the stepwise cellular molecular emergences that constitute vertebrate, vertebrate evolution. As I've stipulated in the publications, it's in tens of pub, uh, papers that I've published as well as 10 books now. Contrary to Darwin, evolution is both probabilistic and deterministic in service to homeostasis, providing a mechanism for Maturana and Varela's Autopoiesis, uh, a book they published in 1982, uh, in which they described autopoiesis as self-referential and self-organizational, but they didn't provide a mechanism. They just described the process. So experimental evidence for non-local gravity superseding local gravity. The phase transition from lipids to micelles is a quantum leap, as I said in an earlier slide. Zero gravity causes cells to lose their phenotypic identity in vitro and in vivo. Um, as I will cite later. And this is probably why Krishnamurti, in, a, in the dialogues that he had with Bohm, in a late dialogue in 1982, um, said to Bohm that you have to lose your ego to connect with cos cos the cosmic consciousness state. The ego is the material state of being. The cosmic consciousness is, again, this quantum level of, um, of being, if you will. So loss of cell-cell signaling during aging and senescence leads to the loss of physiologic identity, no ego. Majur, in 2013, published a, a series of a, a study of patients uh, clinically who were recovering from general anesthesia, uh, showing that it, that process recapitulates brain phylogeny. Uh, Kubler-Ross, for example, uh, in her uh, classic book on death and dying, published in 1969, uh, showed that non um the, the um uh NDEs uh, yeah are associated with seeing a point of light um and that that transition to the non local is cosmic consciousness so is the above um uh, can the above be seen as a return to the singularity or in this mundus um so the body is the memory of this as this as the synthesis of evolution as cell cell communication. The body can remember trauma, for example, and that's been shown uh, in many uh, studies. It answers the Chalmers, uh, David Chalmers, a philosophical question as to what the hard question is. He says the easy question has been answered. These are obvious, but the hard question is seeing red when injured, for example. So if you whack your thumb with a hammer, why do you see red? And I'm saying this is innate. Um, it's um, it's referring back to when we first had a closed uh, uh, circulatory system and then and had the, uh, the the nervous system to feel pain. Um, so this is evidence that the cell can remember. Documented receptor gene duplications and amplifications during the water land transition, uh, for example, parathyroid hormone related protein receptor, the beta adrenergic receptor and glucocorticoid receptor. These are all hormone receptors and they all duplicated during the water to land transition. And, uh, and they were due to positive selection for adaptation to land. So for example, PTHRP, which I uh, studied uh, uh, under NIH granting uh, auspices for 30 years, is an amplification that caused the calcification of the skeleton to support increased ef effective weight on land versus water. So the effective, uh, the effective gravitational forces increased from buoyancy in water to uh, the, the effect of uh, gravity on land. Mathematics of the cell membrane um, is, in my opinion, a Mobius strip. If there is an unus mundus, one would expect there to be mathematics that is consistent with that. So here I'm showing schematically at the top so the, the title of the slide is homology between the Fibonacci sequence and cellular evolution. So I'm showing the 
evolutionary process at the cell level, starting with a naive uh, cell, a my cell, if you will, at the far left. And then over the course of time, you have symbiogenesis increasing the stuff that's in the cell, that's evolution. And the way that that's occurring is through referencing earlier steps in the evolution of the organism, uh, referring back to the first principles of physiology. So there is a self-referential -re self-organizational autopoietic mechanism that Maturana and Varela made famous, actually. And be below that, I'm showing the Fibonacci sequence, which basically does the same thing. You're going from zero to, uh, I'm showing only uh, the first 144 uh, uh, elements of the Fibonacci sequence, but it comes about, as I'm sure you all know, through the addition of the previous two numbers. So zero plus one is one, one plus two is three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm maintaining that, oops, sorry, that these are both basically homologies. Uh, they're both maintaining homeostasis, and they're both, again, this self-referential, self-organizing uh, mechanism. And in fact, I'm of the opinion that the cellular evolution occurred in order to perceive the Fibonacci sequence. This is the evolution actually of consciousness, if you will. So we are conscious of the Fibonacci sequence because it's innate, internal to us. If there is an unus mundus continuum from the Big Bang to the present, it would predict a mathematics consistent with that process. So again, I'm saying that the Fibonacci sequence is that is at least one mathematical expression of that. Uh, similarly, uh, da Vinci uh, expressed the Vitruvian man, uh, man depicted, uh, uh, delineated by the, the circle surrounding it, uh, him, and uh, that in turn I'm showing is a position of this um, spiral form of uh, like uh, the, uh, um, the chambered Nautilus, for example. Uh, there are many, many examples of the gold, golden ratio in architecture, in art, in music, on history, you name it. <clears throat> so the question is, why is there this close uh, approximation of, of, of our uh, consciousness by the Fibonacci sequence? So here I'm showing schematically that the origin of local and non-local consciousness is are interrelated. So if you start in the middle with gravity inducing um, energy, uh, so based on Einstein's uh, um, field theory, you have a force impinging on a curved surface generating the energy necessary for uh, the non-locality of consciousness as quantum entanglement, which if you look to the left, evolved from, uh, as gave rise to symbiogenesis as our local consciousness. Um, and so as Bohm has said, our subjective senses evolved from the implicate order to the explicate order. And, and this is actually a, a corollary of that or basically uh, understanding the mechanism behind that. And if you look to the right, um, the non-local of quantum entanglement re references the cos cosmologic gravity and that's what I cite in this paper to the lower right, uh, published in 2023, entitled Consciousness Embodied Quantum Entanglement. Okay. So the connection of self to the cosmos is a two-tiered system, as I alluded to before, but I think it's an important idea. So the first tier of awareness is the cell membrane, which allows particles to move in and out of the cell through the semi-permeable membrane. And that's a binary. Um, a yes or no kind of thing. But that in turn gives rise to um, factors in the cell which have evolved to form our physiology through cell-cell communication. And so you have this continuum from the non-local cosmic gravity to the local effect of gravity through the quantum entanglement mechanism, uh, giving rise to, to, I'm sorry, on the right, I'm talking about the two-tiered system here. The second tier is the analog, uh, the analog system, which gives rise to physiologic evol evolution through cell-cell communication. So Carl Jung maintained that the world of alchemical symbols does not belong to the rubbish heap of the past, but stands in a very real and living relationship to our most rec recent discoveries concerning the psychology of the unconscious. The recent publication, uh, my publication, that I which I cited just in the previous slide, of uh, the uh, relationship of consciousness to the quantum entanglement mechanism connects the non-local of uh, consciousness of quantum entanglement to the local consciousness of classic Newtonian physics. The premise is that since both symbiogenesis, the process of assimilating factors in the environment that have posed existential threats to form our physiology is in service to maintaining the homeostasis locally, 
on the one hand, and quantum entanglement, the ability to maintain the interrelationship of particles between local and non-local homeostatically, on the other. Then, hypothetically, quantum entanglement evolved into symbiogenesis. So just to briefly go over that consciousness paper. So the background was that if you take uh, lung and or bone cells, which are stretch sensitive, so if you distend them, they actually upregulate, they stimulate PTHRP, mRNA, and protein expression. I showed that, we showed that experimentally years ago. Their physiologic evolution, structure, and function are contingent on that property. So the hypothesis I tested was that in zero gravity, lung and bone cells lose their phenotypic, uh, to phenotypically evolved traits reversibly. So if you put the cells in zero gravity, they lose their phenotypic identity. But then if you put them back in, in unit gravity, the cells will regain their evolved traits within about 24 hours. So the, the, the method was to use this rotating wall vessel uh, in which you take cells and you adhere them to these cephadex beads, which have a certain buoyancy. Uh, so if you put the beads into the in culture medium into the rotating wall vessel and you centrifuge it, you basically uh, emulate free fall, which is virtual zero gravity. It's not exactly uh, zero gravity, but it's close enough for, for this kind of thing. So what, what we measured was uh, mRNA for PTHRP and for the protein. So the mRNA was measured uh, independently of the tagging of the PTHRP P protein using green fluorescent protein as a label. Measuring the expression, the amount of PTHRP that was being uh, produced over the course of this zero G versus one G experiment. So this is the these are the data for the experiment. So if we, we look at the far left, uh, you have the normal state of the PTHRP expression in both for mRNA and protein. And then as you uh, go uh, over time, you lose the P the PTHRP expression over about 12 hour, a 12 hour period, it, the PTHRP forms a new baseline, which is almost at zero here for the protein, not quite for the mRNA. And then if you put the cells back into unit gravity, they recover within about 24 hours. So in other words, the cells were not being damaged. They were actually responding to this zero gravity exp uh, experience. So the conclusion was that zero gravity, in zero gravity, cells lose their evolved traits. This phenomenon has been reproduced both by a group at Boston University, uh, cited in number one by uh, this group, uh, Pariv Dorj Gage et al., um, using yeast, and also by Cameron Goldsman, uh, et cetera, in Montreal, uh, showing that the role of parathyroid hormone related protein in osteoblast response to microgravity is, mechanistic, is a mechanistic implication for osteoporosis development as is well known in astronauts. So that was published in 2020, uh, 2016. So how to explain uh, the state of the cell in zero gravity, given that gravity is necessary for the initiation of cell formation. So Klassen and Spooner showed in, 1990, in a publication in 1996 that the lipo liposomes, these micelles that I described, um, they don't form normally under microgravity. They're, they're uh, heterogeneous which doesn't lend itself to the evolution of the cell. Uh, and I will go into delve into that, but suffice it to say that that's true. So if consciousness is the aggregate of physiology, the functional linking of local and non-local local consciousness exhibited by the effect of zero gravity connects local and non-local or conscious and unconscious through the force of gravity. Um, as I uh, described in a 2023, another 2023 publication. So, it, this is experimental evidence for, in my opinion, for Jung's connection between the alchemical and the collective unconscious. So again, the cell membrane has evolved acting like a Mobius strip, or so I'm claiming, forming a conduit between the inside of the cell and the cosmos. And the reason that I think that it's a, that the membrane is, it's a functional Mobius strip, not a literal Mobius strip, as you, you know, conventionally think about a ribbon of paper, you twist it, you attach the ends, and now you have no inside or outside. No. It's because the cell remembers when it wasn't a cell. It's the memory. So it remembers the, indip the individual lipid molecules before you had a cell membrane. So the homology between Fibonacci series and cellular evolution is shown again here. The cell evolution, as I described earlier, allowing for the recognition of the Fibonacci series. So in other words, the cell ev evolution represents con the evolution of con uh, consciousness, which allows for us to understand, to recognize the Fibonacci sequence. 
this is uh, this convergence of evolution and mathematics is a as a paradigm shift in my opinion. So here are the recognition. Uh, so how and why did this occur? So the recognition that both process both processes maintain homeostasis uh, in an expanding cosmos would potentially explain this uh, convergence of evolution from cell evolution to the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so here I'm showing the intermediate. So between physiologic evolution and the aggregate of that being consciousness or logic, as described by Mario Livio in, in his book on the golden ratio published in 2016, for example. And that in turn allows us to contemplate, to, to recognize the logic of the Fibonacci series, not the other way around. So the prediction, my prediction is that consciousness it acts as both observer and observed. It's not one or the other. It's we are a cipher, and it's missing. And the missing factor in Gödel's it's the missing factor in Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So para, paraphrasing Gödel, Gödel backed into consciousness by deconstructing mathematics. And so a corollary to that would be that incorporating consciousness, both local and non-local, into into Gödel would complete it. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right, can I ask for questions from the, um, yeah, but, but from here, from, uh, from Zoom. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom. Zoom, yeah, Zoom. Um, can I just, uh, Peter, I, I did put a couple of questions to, I posed a question to Andrew and a, post, uh, a question to Albrecht related to, in Andrew's work on um, fonts, and to Albrecht's uh, comments about the difference between Einstein and Lorentz, and that I may be explaining those phenomenal phenomena. So, sorry, just want to mention that. Do Albrecht or Andrew want to reply to that? <laughs> um, I think the idea that the cell is the measure of all things is extremely interesting and seems very widely applicable. Um, and it reminds me very much of Spencer Brown seeing things in terms of distinctions as opposed to aggregates and atoms with qualities, with uh, properties that emerge. So from that point of view, I think it's a hugely interesting approach. Whether I believe the stuff about Fibonacci series and all that, you know, I, I, you know, I say I have my doubts. But that the cell mm -hmm. recapitulates its form throughout the whole history of the Earth seems to me a very beautiful idea. Thank you. So, yeah, I wanted to say that. Um, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Albrecht, would you, did you want Albrecht, to? Albrecht, would you like to say anything? <laughs> Albrecht, would yeah, you like hello. Hello? Yeah. Would you like to say anything? You, you were, he, he asked you if you would like to reply to his question. Yeah, which question? I, I didn't know. Well, can you may repeat the question to you? Can you repeat the question, John? Sure. So, Albrecht, in your beautiful presentation, you said that Einstein and Lorentz dif differed in their opinions uh, and their mathematics because Einstein was a follower of Plato and Lorentz was a follower of Copernicus. So what I'm suggesting is that subjective difference in their logics, that is Einstein versus Lorentz, gave rise to the differences in the mathematics. Mm, uh... Einstein's relativity is based on principles, and there he follows I, uh, Plato, Plato, or Plato, because the um, opinion of Plato was about the world, that the world is built by structures. And these structures, as my position to it, can be described very uh, comfortably by principles. So Einstein was very happy when he found that he could um, develop a, a theory, the theory of relativity, uh, on principles, and so that one could see structures, the structure of wow. space and the structure of time. These both are not, what I say, not uh, physical entities, but uh, concepts or structure entities. He has made a, uh, a mathematical system out of structures, and that was, uh, yeah, uh, conformed to his education. Eh? Whereas um, Lorenz, I think, did not follow no, uh, for Copernicus, he did follow Newton at the end. Uh, he knew, of course, he has taken uh, physical informations which have been developed after 
uh, Newton, so like Maxwell about electromagnetism and so on. Eh? But uh, it's more the thinking of Newton that we have uh, matter, and the matter is uh, controlled by physical laws. That is what uh, Lorentz thinks, and where, in which way Lorentz has built his way of relativity. They are built on, um, uh, on, 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 on knowledge, on existing knowledge about uh, the physics. Lorentz did not have really to invent new things where Einstein has invented a new structure for his build picture of relativity. Is this an answer to you? Somewhat. I mean, what I'm saying is that Gödel's incompleteness theorem um, is correct because what he basically inadvertently um, factored out the mathematics and he, there was something missing from the understanding, the logic. And I'm maintaining that that's the observer. He, he, he ended up with his the, the, uh, the residual of his reduction was consciousness. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is that Einstein and Lorentz had different, somewhat different, differed in their logic. And as a result, the logic gave rise to differences in the mathematics. I do, I do not see it in the way that both had different uh, logic, but they had a different system. Einstein has an abstract mathematical system, and Lorentz has a system which uh, is related to uh, the known physical laws, but the mathematics is not different. Okay, uh, Einstein needed the four-dimensional system, and uh, Lorentz does not need it. That is a difference uh, regarding mathematics. But you can, uh, I think, if uh, a mathematic mathematic mathematician would say, uh, to calculate with three dimension or four dimension is not 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 a, such a fundamental difference. It's both basically the same kind of mathematics, and they use both the same kind of mathematics. That's what I feel. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, was from, I was going more with the Plato versus Copernicus thing. Sorry. So my corner's got a question, but, but Lou wants to make a quick comment. Yeah, continue I want to make a comment, uh, John, to show you that it, in a certain sense, I agree with you about Gödel. Uh, let me explain. Gödel's theorem is correct, um, that if you take a formal system, which amounts to a set of rules that are going to be followed slavishly, exactly those rules, and you try to make it consistent, and contain arithmetic, then there will be theorems in that system which cannot be proved in that system that are nevertheless true. And the truth arises, the truth arises out of the interaction of consciousness with that system. Because in order to prove Gödel's theorem, you have to have a conscious mathematical person who is proving the theorem about the formal system. And that person between that person's consciousness and the formal system arise truths which cannot be proved within the system. And that person can prove that there are truths that are not within the system. In the larger system consisting of the person's consciousness and the original formal system, that incompleteness is resolved. But then it can be made up all over again by making a formal system that acts like the person and the formal system. So we never escape from the basic part of it, which says that if you separate consciousness and make a strictly machine-like entity, it will be incomplete. But I think that this is just another way of stating what you said. Yeah, I agree. So I guess I can address it in terms of AI. I don't think that it'll always be artificial. It will never be general intelligence because you cannot program uh, the system, uh, you cannot create a, a, a mathematical uh, algorithm that's going to address the history of uh, of humankind, of the individual, uh, if you will. That, at least that's my my sense. I, that's the take home for me. So, Mike, you've got a question. Uh, hello, John. This is my corner. Sorry, there's no picture. Uh, the for the audience, some years ago, John Torday and I worked together. And I tried to persuade him to include the concept of information in his thinking and introduced him to biosemiotics and so on. And I see today that I completely and utterly failed. <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, John, had you gone down a slightly different route, in fact, I should say a dramatically different route, 
then the way that you treat memory and the way you treat evolution would be completely different and you wouldn't have to jump through all of the hoops that you've done to actually provide what you might call a materialist solution. Nevertheless, I really enjoyed uh, to hear your latest stuff. As a final tiny comment, um, one of the greats of uh, ANPA is um, uh, David McGovern, and he has written and thought about Girdle and there's now a recent book which is mentioned in the proceedings. If you have any trouble getting to it, it's well worth reading, although it's rather complicated. But thank you, Lou. That's a very coherent thing as far as I'm concerned. So, Mike, I'm, I didn't mean to uh, ignore what you told me, but my problem as a biologist is the one, the one mechanism in biology we know that gives rise to structure and function is embryology. And embryology is a, is a series of energy exchanges. And I, I am of the opinion that it's not, it's not matter, it's energy. So I, I understand information theory, Shannon, but I don't think it's the basis for our existence. I think the basis for our existence is energy exchanges and homeostasis. Okay. Let, me let me make one more attempt. Sure. <laughs> Several years later, uh, going, going off of what Andrew said with the idea of a cell, you downplayed Maturan and Varela. Their book and their invention was really about two things, cognition, if you like, consciousness and the physical cell. So in the model, the energy has got two faces, one of which is matter and the other one is information then all of the things you're talking about is truly energy, but it's guided by information, which is part of the memory of the individual, part of the memory of the whole idea of cells on planet Earth and possibly other things. But it does give an entirely different slant on uh, how a cell evolves and how individuals have memories and where consciousness comes from. I'm preaching what I was preaching a few months ago, <laughs> whenever we worked together. But I, as I say, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, if I just um, rebut and say that uh, again, in embryology, uh, the I, I did this work for 50 years in, as a laboratory person. Okay, so the key to understanding how cells uh, grow and differentiate is these uh, um, soluble growth factors that were discovered by. Stanley Cohen, for example, who won the Nobel for his work, those growth factors, they have no information. It's only the cell that is informed, if you will. But in, has... in, in your scheme, John, yeah. right at the beginning, yeah. you do not include information. Therefore, no. you cannot give that explanation in, in any other way. By the way, I was talking to Albrecht and I asked him, where do you come from in the sort of big picture? And he absolutely admitted his entire way of thinking is to do with matter and physics as far as he's concerned. So I couldn't have a discussion with him. And it reminded me of our discussion, which went nowhere several years ago. I think we should stop here. But otherwise, we're wasting people's time. I see Mark Johnson speaking. That's great. Peter, give him the give well, him the mic. I, is it relevant to this or is it another question, Mark? As I was before, my because, because Nick has been waiting to ask the question. But I don't mind if it's relevant. No, 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 no Nicola. Sorry, I don't. I don't want to um, disrupt the order. No. Okay. Well, we'll, well go I, with Nicola. Then yeah, you go with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that fast because because mine is kind of like is um is sideways. Yeah. So uh, in, in terms of cell membrane. I just wanted to tell you, John, that uh, when I did a biochemistry A-level as part of my craniosacral training, uh, I wrote a eulogy about the cell membrane because it is so beautiful um, and, and so complex and so wonderful. Um, I've been wondering recently, and I'm just thinking about, you, know, you were talking about consciousness as observer and observed, observed, <laughs> observed, observed. Um, I've been wondering recently what it's like to incarnate as a planet and what it would be like to incarnate as a cell. And uh, 
Well, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, I think there's a fundamental difference between the inanimate and the animate in terms of um, <laughs> the inanimate is a stable, you know, creates stability through uh, chemical reactions, whereas that's the you know the death knell for biology for the for the animate. So you're always in a state of flux between the deterministic and the probabilistic, and and uh, have to be aware of your environment in order to maintain equipoise, uh, homeostatic uh, energy uh, state, which which is not the case for the inanimate. It's that's sta stability. Um, so I guess that's my simple answer to your question. Well, can, you, you, still don't, come... you don't oh. think that Gaia is animate? Is that what you're saying? Um, not, it's... See? Yeah, right. No, no, no. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying that the, the, it's the ability of the animate to absorb, to, in, to integrate the, the inanimate that is the key to Gaia. So in other words, I don't think the planet itself is is living. I think the organisms in it and on it are living. Oh dear. Well, <laughs> people do hear that. And Mark, Mark, you've got a question. Mark? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. So I, I suppose my, I, I wonder if the discussion that's happening, which is extremely interesting, is about abstraction and about whether it is ever possible for us to escape abstraction. And um, I suppose one way in which that might be possible is in things like music and the arts. Um, I think attempts to formalize inevitably take us back to Gödel. And I suppose I'm, I'm saying again what, what Lou said, um, as soon as you've got a formal system, you've got, you've got incompleteness. So it, it's almost as if science is always caught in, in a trap um, that as much as it tries to abstract and schematize and formalize, as soon as it does it, we, we, we miss ourselves in some way. Um, the, the, only, the only question I've got at the back of my mind as to whether this is correct, I, I, I think so much about Peter's work and, and particularly the stuff, the, the sort of Clifford algebra related stuff, whether, whether some of that trap is to do with the fact that we conflate different dimensions, that actually understanding and being clear about the dimensionality of our concepts is is a way of getting around this? I just don't know. I'd be interested to know what people think. Lou's going to no, okay. let me make a comment about it. Um, if you regard yourself as always free to make more formalism, just like as a music, as a composer of music, you allow yourself to write more music or make up new notations for music, then the Gerbilian trap disappears. Yes, you're right. Yes. Yes, that's right. And is it the same if you create new formalisms? Uh, so if, if you create new formalisms as a mathematician, so if you're creating new algebras or uh, new ways of manipulating dimensions, is that the same? Well, uh, new rules. So formalism is some set of rules that you happen to like. So you wrote, maybe you've been writing your music in, um, in 18th century um, uh, mode, uh, for all your life and suddenly you realize that you could shift to a different mode that you invented or a jazz mode or something else, you're allowed. Why, aren't, why wouldn't you be allowed? Why wouldn't you be allowed to make up your own rules? What we do, what we do characteristically as human beings is make up some rules and then follow them. But then we fall into the trap that we're supposed to always follow the, the very rules and no other rules. Why should we fall into that trap? Yes, quite. No, I, I've always enjoyed breaking the rules, and that there is some fund something really fundamental about that. And um, I mean, this this goes back to a conversation, well, an argument really that John and I have had for for a long time about the difference between science and art. And I've always felt that in in so many ways. Um, <sighs> 
They're not doing exactly the same thing, but they are both required. They are both necessary. Um, I don't know if I can say any more about that, it's, but it's... Well, one it's, thing that happens in science is that we, we set up some rules like Newton's laws or Schrodinger's equation or whatever, and then we try to follow it as far as we can until it, until it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. We know it's not going to work after a while, and we're hoping. <laughs> yeah. We're hoping to find out where it doesn't work. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can I bring in Nicola here? Yeah. Um, in, in my talk, Mark, I was talking about the, I was talking about Vedic measure and I was talking about musical measure and how these are different from our normal measure, which is linear measure, which comes from vision. It comes from vision in a very specific relation to touch, so to, to matter as we experience it in normal 3D. So, and the tendency there is, is to go into the world of I, it, the Buberian world of I, it, which makes everything it, and then it's abstractions and you can get lost. Whereas musical measure and the Vedic measures, which relate to the other senses, are actually the possibility of other kinds of ways of being in the world. And I think that's, you know, why you say, oh, well, maybe it, you, we discover it through music. And that's it. We, we are not, we are not just, you know, walking heads. We are embodied beings. We incarnate, we become flesh. And we have the, this amazing, these amazing different senses. And in, in my view, the, the way that I am interested in developing mathematics, one way anyway, is particularly in terms of how, what are these, you know, is, is there a way of being and thinking in these different senses, which bring about different languages and how, if we just take these five, how can we bring these together? And I think this, and, and I think this is actually a living, this is a, a, it's a way of living. It's a way of living and going on living in ourselves and with others. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I risk my case. <laughs> Over to John. Um, at the risk of being obnoxious, uh, back to my corner. Um, I, can, I cannot ex explain my zero gravity experiment based on information. The deprivation of this of energy, the gravitational energy, is what causes the loss of information, not the other way around. So again, you may I'd like you to comment, but. Um, I think that speaks volumes about, about this, the hierarchical order of things. It would be impossible, John, to reply between now and when they have to close up the library. But uh, I will make a, another effort five years later to persuade you that your idea of information is using the same word, but is not the same concept at all. Okay. All right, well, that's fair enough. Okay. And, I, and I'd just like to say that I thought that was I, really interesting. I did not know that, well, first of all, that the, the phenotype would be lost in zero gravity and more important, would come back when gravity is returned. That, you know, that just sort of doing, that's really very interesting. So thank you. Well, thank you for a lot of your talk anyway. Well, Nicola, just back to my, you seem to be flummoxed by my saying that Gaia is, that, that the planet is not alive. I think it's an anthropocentric way of thinking to think that the planet is alive because we've internalized it. We've internalized the cosmos. That's the key to consciousness. Yeah. So that's where well, that- I think it's the mechanicomorphic way of thinking to think that she's not conscious, but we, that's another conversation. We can, we can have more conversations too. Well, see, for me, the, the critical question is, I think it's a, gen, a truism that we all feel that there's something greater than ourselves. That's why I didn't put on a cleric's, you know, uh, garb. I'm a scientist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're all seeking an answer to that question, in my opinion. And I do think that the answer to that question is that symbiogenic mechanism that Margulis came up with many, many years ago. She was a professor of mine as an undergraduate, actually. So anyway, yeah. John, it's a pity that you didn't have access to the earlier talks. There were several references to Teilhard de Chardin 
whose image which guides all of the way he thinks about stuff is first of all that reality has multiple levels which our normal one doesn't have and that the entire thing is alive so in that model it's not even worth asking the question whether the earth is alive by definition it is so that's the sort of difference in scope that we're talking about here I think we should stop because there's supposed to be a little discussion. Yeah, can about... I just add one final more, comment? One more comment. Um, I would like to suggest that the feeling that there's something greater than ourselves is exactly analogous to the Girdle theorem. But the Girdle theorem is exactly that, that we, when we feel there's something greater than ourselves, what we're saying to ourselves is that whatever description we have produced for ourselves is not quite all. Because it's at the level of description and there's something beyond that. Yeah. yeah. But I'm saying the mechanism underlying that is symbiogenesis. Can I now say thank you to the speaker and all the people who contributed to the conversation. We will switch off this recording and uh, for the moment, just a moment, let's switch it off the recorder. And it'll be over to you, Mike. So yeah, hang on, let's switch off the recording first. We might switch it on again for this, okay. but we want the things to be separate. Oh, fair enough. Very uh, stop recording, that's it, isn't it? Does that stop recording? Yep. Yes, you, yes, you do.